Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. Just 25 years ago, America planted the stars and stripes on the moon. A great nation had achieved a great feat. But soon we scaled back. Is America no longer looking for new frontiers? Joining us to sort through the conflict and the consensus are Daniel Boorstin, Pulitzer Prize winning historian, the Librarian of Congress Emeritus and author of The Discoverers, John Logston, director of the Space Policy Institute at George Washington University and author of The Decision to Go to the Moon, Project Apollo and the National Interest, Michael Novak, Jewett Chair at the American Enterprise Institute and winner of the 1994 Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion and Professor Rita Caldwell of the University of Maryland and President-elect of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. On the 25th anniversary of the first moon landing, the question before this house, where next America? This week on Think Tank. Americans have always been pioneers. Lewis and Clark first crossed the continent in 1805. By 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. And after the British and the French failed, America built the Panama Canal. And in 1961, a new young president declared the nation would open another new frontier. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Thus began the race to the moon. NASA's Apollo moon landing program was a colossal effort involving 400,000 workers, 20,000 contractors, and costing almost $80 billion. And on the evening of July 20th, 1969, astronaut Neil Armstrong was the first person to set foot on the moon. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man. One America had gone from the first flight of the Wright Brothers biplane at Kitty Hawk to the moon in just 66 years. America returned to the moon five more times. Since then, we have continued to send astronauts into near-Earth orbit, but we have never gone back to the lunar surface. Then disaster struck. In 1986, the Challenger space shuttle exploded. For nearly three years, the American space program was grounded. Meanwhile, ambitious plans to build a permanent space station and to send men to Mars have been postponed. And another grand scientific project, the Superconducting Super Collider, designed to probe deep into the heart of matter itself, was abandoned. At the end of the 20th century, some critics say that America has lost the pioneering spirit and question whether the United States has either the will or the wallet to embark on new ambitious national ventures. Dr. Daniel Borston, um, has America lost its pioneering spirit? No, I think not. On, on the contrary, I think we should remi remember, in the first place, at the risk of uh, laboring the obvious, I'd like to remind us all here that if it hadn't been for a voyage of discovery, a very expensive voyage of discovery about 500 years ago, we wouldn't be sitting here today no telling where we would be. But there is some, it is also notable that our, uh, uh, our age of discovery is an age of public discovery. And the experience of discovery of the landing on the moon is entirely different from any other great discovery that, uh, that mankind has achieved. I was there with my wife and children in our living room in, uh, just outside Chicago uh, 25 years ago. And uh, that has given the act of discovery a communal significance. Uh, it brings us together in a way in which uh, Columbus is, when Columbus made his discovery, you know, that message didn't get back to Spain for seven months. And it was three years before people in England had heard of it. But we were there, and discovery is an electrifying, a catalytic experience for all of us now. Jo John uh, Logsdon, do, do you think uh, we've sort of lost that great urge? I think underlying our sentiments there is that, but we've kind of gotten caught up in the problems of the day or the week, and, and uh, maybe have lost a little bit of our ability to uh, uh, organize for grand things. And, Thinking about this period in history, it was only 25 years from D-Day to landing on the moon. 
uh, both large centrally organized major undertakings. Now, 25 years later, we're debating, can we do that kind of large scale? Should we do that kind of large scale undertaking? Rita, uh, Rita Caldwell, as uh, president elect of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, do, do you sense uh, that there is an anti-science feeling growing in this country? I don't think it's an anti-science feeling so much as um, a, an apprehension at the, at the tremendous amount of change that's taking place. I think we're in a transition period where we really are refocusing on societal needs and on the directions we want society to take because after all, we spent the last 50 plus years strengthening ourselves for an adversary that of course has crumbled and now we are looking to where we can strengthen ourselves as a society. But there are changes taking place that are very dramatic. The uh, computer changes, the changes in medicine, and that marriage of uh, technology and uh, biology, I think, is going to bring some very interesting changes the, through the century. Those are mostly private projects, not public projects. The, well, ones, the ones you just mentioned, computer and biotech, sure. are principally private, not public. But they're manifested, I think, in a very large project, the Human Genome Project, which is a multi-billion dollar project that is, again, sort of inward looking. And that is designed to do what, the Human Genome Project, I mean? To understand the very structure of uh, humans, the genetic basis of heredity, what makes us, um, let us say, uh, a European, an American, what makes us think uh, the genes that control um, not only disease, but uh, health and strength and, and intelligence. That, that's mapping the DNA. So mapping called. the DNA. M Michael Novak, well, you are a, uh, have come at this at a somewhat different perspective, perhaps. H have Americans uh, lost that will for the, for the great adventure? No, I, I think that uh, what Professor Colwell just talked about, the, the new biological exploration that's going on, is just fantastic. And Americans are using their practical inventiveness every day. In the celebrations of uh, D-Day, I remember reading that uh, uh, f the Ford lines uh, uh, began producing uh, 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 an aircraft uh, a day at certain factories, the Liberty ships, uh, one a week. Uh, this was inventiveness just pushed uh, to the ultimate at that time. I think that's going on every day throughout uh, American life. Uh, the pro communal projects, I think, uh, have taken a back burner, but, uh, but it's going on privately. I think uh, uh, the menace to the spirit of discovery, that is, the willingness to reach in the unknown, is the very spirit of invention. Technology aims to solve a particular problem, to produce a, a horseless uh, carriage, a, a, a plane that will fly. Uh, but the spirit of discovery is the voyage into the unknown. And our preoccupation with uh, the cost effective, uh, with, what will, with the question whether this will pay off, uh, tends to lead us away from the voyage into the unknown. Because we all know really that the most, the best things in the world are not cost effective. The best experiences, uh, uh, love and, uh, and children are the least cost effective things on earth. And yet they are, they are examples of the importance of, of not calculating. But people, people argue today politically, Dan, <coughs> as, as, as you know, they say, well, uh, the, uh, the space, the man in the moon is the equivalent of building a pyramid in space. Here are the yes. Egyptians. And what about affordable housing? What about health care? What about yes. poor people? What about education? You would, how, how, do, how do you, you must get that question all the time. How, how do you deal with that? Well, I would remind you, and I wrote a chapter on this in The Discoverers, uh, the, the pyramids uh, were not an entirely fruitless enterprise. They were a community enterprise. They, they, there were lots of Egyptians who were proud of their pyramids, they, but there weren't so many they, other things to be proud they of. They built up a tourist trade, I mean, well, 2,000 well, years exactly. later. I mean, exactly. you know, what do we remember Egypt for? Uh, good housing or the pyramids? I mean, what, what is the United States in the last third of this century going to be remembered for? I'm sure one of the things is being first on the moon. I mean, in the, in the broad future historical sweep, that will be one of the accomplishments for which the 20th century is remembered. I think that's one of the things that made the moon voyage uh, so exciting and so dramatic, is it was beyond the ordinary humdrum things. We had, uh, we had already had the highest level of, of living in the world, but to, to go out beyond and see ourselves in a whole new way from a distance, to see the fragility of this planet, the way we're all one, I think that that was an evocation of a kind of mystery. I, I, I think I would uh, remind us that um, 
s flight itself did not um, start in a dramatic way. The Wright brothers made their forays. Uh, there was a further expansion, but suddenly we found ourselves transformed. And I would maintain that this is happening in neurobiology and in computer science where we are learning how to reconstruct the thought process. And I think by the time we come to the year 2000, the combination of the technology through biotechnology coupled with the exploration into thought and simulation of thought, we'll find that we have another revolution in our hands. John Long, let me ask you a question, a uh, historical one, because I know you're, you're working on this project. W why did we go to the moon? Well, I mean, why, why did we put a man on the moon? I mean, first of all, we didn't go for science. Uh, it, was, it was a project of discovery, but discovery and science are not the same things. We went because of Cold War competition with, with the Soviet Union. In, in my work, I, f I found this kind of classic memo from John Kennedy to Lyndon Johnson, written a few days after the first Russian went into space, first human in space. Kennedy asked the vice president for an overall survey of where we stand in space and said, uh, do we have a chance of beating the Soviets? by a long list of things. Is there any other space program which promises dramatic results in which we could win? I mean, there were the so criteria, I, space, I, I, drama, win. John, this is, you're, you're suggesting an, an objective that William James assigned us nearly a century ago when he called for the moral equivalent of war. Right. Yes. And that is what discovery has provided us. It has, has uh, produced uh, enormous investment a sense of community, of patriotism, of rivalry, which is also a good thing between civilized countries in, in this kind of area. And uh, that, I think, is, is a way of describing uh, some of the potentialities of, uh, of the space exploration, which cannot be estimated in, in budget terms. Some of the great cathedrals were built out of rivalry between city and city. Sure. And they were built as a matter not only of, of religious dedication, but of civic pride. So rivalry doesn't necessarily close down the element of mystery that's involved and, and excitement. And it, it, Dan, it, is it that you have studied this? Do, do, do great nations and great civilizations make grand gestures? Is, is that sort of a law of history that, that when you have a great nation, they feel they have to build the pyramid or send the man to the moon or build Notre Dame? Or is that sort of a mix? Well, uh, for the first place, uh, Ben, I don't believe in laws of history. I think uh, what we're uh, and, and I think that what we're talking about today a man, moon man landing on the moon is the best illustration that could ever be given uh, of the uh, impossibility of predicting history. Let me ask you uh, a if people were going to say what's the most outlandish thing you could imagine or outrageous is, is man landing on the moon. I, I, if, so if, so if that we, we don't talk about okay, laws okay. of history. If, if we were sitting here a thousand years from now and somebody said what was the most important thing that happened in the 20th century. Is it plausible that the answer would be, oh, that was the year a man first landed on the moon? I think it's perfectly possible, but I, I can't, I couldn't predict that. Uh, we might be sitting on the moon a thousand years from now, too. That's another possibility. So, no, well, well, that, I, I don't no, think no, we uh, oh, will be. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. John, John, uh, John Logsdon ha has written of the 1969 space, uh, uh, the landing on the moon that it was the initial step toward Homo sapiens becoming a multi-planet species. Do you believe that if we're sitting here a thousand years from now or 500 years from now, that, that man will have be, be colonizing space? Man and woman. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Or otherwise, <laughs> there's no colonies, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, as, no as, they, as they say, right. man embraces woman, right. Uh, right, right yeah. uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that, that there, the idea that given the technological capability, which we've already demonstrated, that we're going to stay on this planet forever goes against human nature. So it's not a question of whether, it's a question of when and under what organizational leadership. I and mean, we did it as a competitive enterprise in the 60s. Can we cooperate as a species in doing this large-scale expeditions in the future? Or does it still have to be somehow a rivalry? But, but going back to the moon, first like Antarctica, science-based sort of thing, and then eventually uh, out beyond the moon uh, to asteroids or to Mars, I think is, is close to an inevitability. I, I agree with Dan. There's no certainty in history. but. Uh,
uh, it seems to me that humans want to see what's over the next hill. May I, may I, I suggest sorry. that what will trigger it will be what has been sort of science fiction to the president. That is looking for evidence of life, origin of life, or explanation of the evolution of life on this planet. I think that tie uh, may very well be the the uh, triggering factor for this further exploration. I think one reason this sort of project stands out is it's not just exploring what we can do and what we can know, but who are we? It, it shows, it, it sheds an interesting light on our, our whole destiny, our whole predicament here in the universe. And that gives this particular scientific adventure a dimension that not all have. Some others have, but not all have. I think, uh, of course, um, Michael would give it a more theological import. <laughs> Uh, I would, would be a little less theological and qualify the observation earlier and say that, suggest that perhaps we're not going from, uh, we're moving from homo sapiens to homo ludens, man at play. We have these tools, we can play around with them in outer space, isn't that wonderful? And I think to stand in amazement and delight, that also is, is a sign of our humanity. And that's why I think humans have to be involved. Sending machines is not the same thing. The, the memo that went to Kennedy that recommended Apollo said, it's men, not machines, that capture the imagination of the world. And I think that's true in 94. Rita, if, if, if in your role as president-elect of the American Academy of the Advancement of Science, you went to the Congress for a specific project and said, the eminent historian Dan Borston says, this is a good thing because it's man at play. Uh, and they're sitting there with these budgets, uh, and they're saying, "I have poor, I have poor kids, I have poor kids in the ghetto." I, you know the list. What, 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 what do you say when, when if, if you quote Dan Borston and say, "Hey, it's a good thing to have man at play"? I think it would be uh, humans learning about their origins and their future, and I would suggest that we now have uh, the tools that we didn't have at the time of of the the moon landing to determine whether there was life. Uh, at least as we know it, on the moon, on Mars, through the DNA technology, the nucleic acid fragments that we now uh, can uh, determine uh, the relationship and the origin of. So I think we have the technology to answer some very fundamental questions that we couldn't have done several years ago, yeah, 30 years I mean, ago. I would suggest a, a better way of a pro perhaps testifying before Congress when you think of man at play. I'm not thinking of uh, people kicking a soccer ball around, sure. but I'm thinking of Benjamin Franklin and his kite. Exactly. That's how we learned the, the exactly. uh, relationship of electricity to it, lightning. It, Dan, That's, that, he was, that was the kind of playful thing to do, wasn't it? It's to learn, to understand, to find out what this uh, Dan, is, is the Was the space program and the landing on the moon specifically, and, and, and its continuation, specifically an American uh, accomplishment or a human accomplishment, and is that well, it's a human accomplishment because we are the heirs of all, of all the scientists before us. But there's another point I'd like to put to our eminent theologian, Michael, and that is, uh, it, it's much of it is contained in the par in the parable of the of the Garden of Eden and the eating of the apple, which suggests that there's always a price. You know that that knowledge uh, knowledge uh, has uh, has both the good and the evil side to it. You know when you know things, you have a destiny that you can't abdicate. We, we must use the electronic, the, the atomic powers to get us to the moon, but also we're cursed with the possibilities of atomic warfare. And I think that's something we must, we must remember, that there's always a price, and discovery is, gives us both a reward and a price which we can never, never predict or imagine. That's why we should pursue them. John, is there anything like the moon mission coming up next? I mean, where, where does... No, uh, we've, what, we've what? been in a kind of 25-year hangover. Uh, we, we've built means rather than goals. We've built a space shuttle that was supposed to make it cheap and easy to get in space. It isn't. We are building a space station, granted Congress's goodwill. Uh, so at the turn of the century, we'll have an international research laboratory in space still not knowing exactly what we're going to do there, but that's just going in circles. It's not very where, where exciting. Is, where is the big stuff going to come from, Pi uh, public or private? You've got to differentiate when you talk about space between using space for profit or purposes on Earth. That's private sector activity, communication right. satellites, uh, Earth observation. But I think the exploration, the next round of space exploration, is still going to be government driven. Uh, do, do you think we will have to await some kind of grand international rivalry for 
the kind of next step? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful and hoping, uh, and maybe the latter, uh, that the next time it can be done as a collaborative enterprise, saying here's a way of demonstrating the ability of major nations to work together on a challenging goal, that it doesn't have to be head-on-head -head competition. What avenues do you see for that? John. Well, we're doing it in the space station. The space station now involves the U.S., Canada, Japan, Europe, and Russia. I mean, it is all the major spacefaring countries working together in a single thing. It's a grand experiment in technological collaboration. The other end, Rita mentioned the Human Genome Project, which is an international, international. project totally, uh, division of labor among uh, laboratories all over the world. We can learn to do this sort well, of thing. Well, actually, let me interject and say that I think that that's the direction science, in fact, is going. The internationalization of science, I think, is a fairly dramatic and possibly a revolutionary kind of event because the, the big programs cannot be done I think, by individual countries. I just wanted to say that that international collaboration that you both were talking about a moment ago was already symbolized. When, when we looked for the first time from the moon back to the Earth and saw it there little yes. and blue and fragile, but one, if you talk about interplanetary exploration, right. in a certain way, then the whole planet is involved. And so that, that was already there in Michael, nutshell. Michael, you sound like a world federalist. <laughs> you're, you're a, well, I'm, I'm not a world federalist, but we are one people. And uh, if, if Dan will permit me, one people under God. And a particular God, a Jewish Christian a Jewish Christian God who, who gave us all the vocation to create and explore. And the confidence we all have that exploration will be on the whole good is told there on that very first page of the Bible and God created everything and saw that it was good. We do have that optimism. It's a great gift to our civilization and it's resulted in a tremendous amount of exploration. We're far from and, finished. And, and not in conflict with goals to help the poor or... No. Absolutely not. No, uh, there is an illusion that the space program costs lots of money, and in absolute terms, it's expensive. But as a proportion of what government spends or of the wealth of society, it's a very, very small fraction. We can afford to have a good space program if we choose to have one. We've gone to, begun to realize that what is done in one country environmentally affects another country. We've begun to understand that decisions on uses of chemicals, uh, decisions on, on uh, ex exploring and exploiting some aspect of the environment does affect the rest of the globe. And I think this interdependency is part of the international uh, uh, attitude and, and uh, development in science. Isn't that going to engender politically in the United States the case that we are losing our sovereignty? I think we're gaining a I great mean, you, deal you, more. You hear it in, in, the, in the trade agreements. I mean, that's what, that's what some of the arguments are about. We're losing our sovereignty. And you are saying the great new moon projects, the Panama Canal, it's going to be, every, it's going to be everybody's but, flag up there. Isn't it, uh, isn't it true that in the world of knowledge, there is no sovereignty. There's only diffusion. That is, mm -hmm. knowledge is the only commodity that increases by diffusion. But, but Neil so Armstrong you can, you know, didn't put a UN flag up there. No, but, but the world profited from, from that, uh, that the posture of that flag. It was a human flag, not just a well, American flag. It didn't flag. say one small step for U.S. citizens. No. <laughs> <laughs> and that was appropriate that he didn't say that. Yes. But I think that we must recognize, as Rita points out, that uh, the advancement of knowledge is the advancement of a common store, which the value of which increases the more it's diffused. You know, uh, Michael talked earlier about the, some of the theological aspects of discovery, of, of finding our place in the universe. And, and th there is a debate for those of us that, that are close into the space community of what kind of goal could energize future activity in space. And then one of the ones is looking for planets around other stars, uh, trying to understand what, how unique or whether our solar system is unique. But when we think about the effect on national attitudes, I think the important thing is to realize that the whole space enterprise has awakened us to areas of ignorance that we never imagined, and that's the spirit of discovery. The zest for the quest, the reaching for what you don't know, and, and not because you, you, you expect something particular, but because you don't know what to expect. Well, we're coming up on the 25th anniversary of Apollo. Uh, Mr. Clinton and Mr. Gore trying to figure out what they should say about it, and we'll leave that to them. But there's been a lot of talk about virtual reality, about sending our sensors and staying home. To me, that's very unsatisfactory. Just sitting on this planet and letting our machines do our exploration, not very attractive future to me. Uh, thank you, uh, Daniel Borston and Rita Caldwell. 
uh, John Logsdon and uh, Michael Novak, and thank you. You know, this is a new program, and we have appreciated uh, hearing from you. Please do send your comments to the address on the screen. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.